Good morning to everybody in the room. Good morning to everybody following us on the Zoom and everybody who will be watching this later in the week on YouTube. We are studying the book of Leviticus. Uh, this is the seventh lesson on it. Um, we're studying it because we don't know what to do with the book. Uh, you know, it's in the Bible. It's got a lot of strange stuff in it. Uh, we get to read some strange stuff today. Uh, some stuff. We can get to read something that you're not going to let the youth group read because if you let them read it, you've lost them. And uh, so we'll read that here in a little bit. Um, but uh, uh, there's you know there's all this stuff about sacrifices and clean and unclean stuff and and what to do with a pot if it gets moldy and and stuff like that. And so uh, so it seems strange to us. We don't really study the book. But the Apostle Paul tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed. When the Apostle Paul wrote that to Timothy, there was no New Testament. He wasn't done writing 60% of it yet. And uh, so he was talking about all this stuff in the Old Testament, including the book of Leviticus. Uh, so um, kind of catching up last week, we looked at the, the sons of the high priest Aaron, how they offered strange or a, a foreign unauthorized fire before God. Uh, that's in chapter 10. Um, and now we're going to move into chapters 11 through 15. And we're just going to start diving into the purity laws. Uh, uh, so uh, so there's this dietary legislation. There's this legislation on what is pure, what is uh, impure, what's clean, what's unclean. Um, there's all this stuff about ritual cleanliness. Um, and it's, it's weird to us because it's not something we do. Uh, it's not something that seems important to us, and and to be clear from the itself, uh, from the itself, from the clear from the start, uh, we'll use that word. Uh, the the a lot of this purity and, and uncleanliness and and what's clean food, and what's unclean is is clearly uh, canceled in the New Testament for us. Um, for instance, if we turn to um, uh, where's note to Mark? I believe it is. We'll get to it because I haven't got that far in my notes yet. All right, but let's look at uh, the we, we've talked so far about the role of the priests and what the priests do. And if we look at Leviticus chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, uh, we get clear instructions on the role of the priests, what their their primary job is. And it says, uh, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 10, uh, this is the, the instructions God gives to the priests, verses 10 and 11. He says, you must distinguish between the holy and the common, and the clean and the unclean, and teach the Israelites all the statutes that the Lord has given to them through Moses. So that's the two primary tasks of the priests. To distinguish between between clean and unclean, between holy and common, and to teach Israel the law of Moses. That's their two primary roles. And so, as we uh, look at that, that's the, the rest of the book of Leviticus. Uh, chapters uh, 11 through 15 deal with holy and common, or clean and unclean. And then uh, chapters 17 through 26 are going to deal with what a holy life looks like, how to deal with your neighbors and how to you know, punish crime and, and stuff like that. Uh, uh, Leviticus chapter 16 deals specifically with the Day of Atonement. And we'll spend a whole lesson just on the Day of Atonement. Um, and so, but it, it kind of bridges the gap or, or brings all this stuff together into to one thing. Uh, so, but we'll we'll look at the Day of Atonement in another lesson. As I said, uh, this the the cleanliness stuff we're about to look at the whole uh, the the clean and unclean, pure and impure. Uh, that's clearly um, stopped or canceled or, or answered in the New Testament. Uh, we'll turn real quick to Mark chapter seven. So. Mark gives some commentary right there in the middle in verse 19. He says, Jesus, by teaching this, made all food clean. And so he, he done away with, in that one teaching, 
the the the, the kosher laws. Um, we'll see that again in uh, Acts chapter ten. We'll look at that more later. But when Peter has the vision of the the sheet coming down with all the unclean animals in it, and he's told to rise up, kill, and eat. Um, which, uh, by the way, has been one of the coolest hunting shirts I've ever seen. Some church in Lakeland, uh, they had uh, their, I guess it was their men's group or whatever, they had camo shirts, and on the back it said, Rise Up, Kill and Eat. I'm like, yes, awesome. Um, but, um, uh, and so we, we see the New Testament says, all right, Christians don't have to worry about clean and unclean foods. We can eat bacon. Yes, right? Um, we can eat bacon-wrapped shrimp. Even better, and uh, but uh, uh, but there's still something here for us. We don't get just to throw the whole book out because that that law has been taken out. There's still something there. Paul still tells Timothy, all Scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching and and rebuking and correcting and training up in the ways of righteousness. So there's there's principles here we still need to understand and we still need to learn. Um, we're going to briefly overview it, though. We're not going to read every one of them. We're not going to go into great detail and try to understand every detail in them. Um, we're going to go over and get a general idea of what's there and then uh, take that, uh, draw some, some uh, principles from those general ideas and bring them forward. Um, so first, uh, we need to answer the question, why? Why is God concerned with the cleanliness? What's the deal? Why is he concerned with that? So let's go back to Leviticus, to Leviticus chapter 15, verse 31. Leviticus 15, verse 31. If you'll read along with me there, Leviticus chapter 15, verse 31, God says, you must keep the Israelites from their uncleanness so that they do not die by defiling my tabernacle that is among them. Okay. So God's concerned with his people. If they bring their uncleanliness into the presence of God, they defile his tabernacle, they'll die. Um, and so as strange as these laws seem to us, the statement lets us know God's concern. He doesn't want his people to die. He's in their presence. If we go back to where we started all this in the book of Exodus, uh, God was worried about going with them into uh, there at Mount Sinai. God was worried about going with them into the land of promise because he was worried his holiness would destroy them. And so this whole thing that's coming in Leviticus is an act of God's grace. God wants to be with his people. He wants to be in their presence, but he doesn't want to destroy them in the process. So he, God has given all the laws that are in Leviticus out of grace, out of his concern to make it possible for them to be in his presence. Um, so that's one thing we need to understand from the get-go. As arbitrary as they may seem to us, God had a purpose. And God's purpose wasn't to be a killjoy. Uh, his purpose was he wanted to live in the presence of his people, and he wanted them to be able to do that safely. Not safely for him because he's God. We can't cause any harm to God, uh, but he can cause a whole lot of harm to us. And so he, he, he comes up with this way. He says this is an effective way for uh, these people to be in my presence. And just quickly going over what these uh, chapters cover, uh, Leviticus uh, chapter 11 covers uh, clean and unclean animals. God says, all right, you can eat these kinds of animals, you can't eat these kinds. Uh, he says, pigs are unclean. Crickets are great. Eat them. I'd rather eat a pig than a cricket, personally. Uh, but, and like camels and horses and stuff, those are unclean. Can't eat those. Uh, cows, uh, sheep, uh, goats, all that's good. Uh, fish are good unless it's a predatory fish uh, or if it's a, a bottom feeder. So catfish, sharks, no good. Um, uh, crabs, shrimp, oysters, all that's unclean. Um, then we get into chapter, tw huh? Bats, bats are unclean. Yes, bats are unclean. Um, uh, chapter twelve uh, talks about pure purification after childbirth. 
uh, there was some things women had to do uh, to uh, to for purification after childbirth, and um, uh, we see uh, Mary. Uh, if you look in the New Testament, she obeys this this uh, law. They go up to the temple to make sacrifices for her after the birth of Jesus. Uh, God makes provisions for uh, for women who are poor. Uh, if they can't afford to bring a a, a lamb forward uh, to be sacrificed, and they can bring uh, doves, birds who are real cheap. Um, and so uh, there's also special provision if it's a firstborn male. Uh, this goes way back into the, the Exodus. Uh, they have to redeem a firstborn male uh, before God. Um, and so there's all these rules that must be done before the woman's considered ritually clean again. Uh, chapters uh, 13 and 14 are going to deal with, the, uh, we'll say as a whole disease uses the word leprosy a lot. Skin disease was a big problem, for a uh, big worry, big scare for them. Um, but it also includes uh, other kinds of disease and infection. Uh, it also includes uh, uh, like mold growth in your house, uh, how to deal with that. Or if you got you know mildew on your sheets of your bed, or uh, remember they use clay pots. So if you start getting mold growth on a clay pot, what do you need to do with that? Uh, again, seems strange to us what's going on there, but one general thing we can see in these chapters is God's concern with the health of his people. Uh, the rules he gives aren't necessarily uh, some kind of magical treatment for whatever disease the person might have, whatever leprosy or skin disease they might have or infection, uh, but the rules actually help stop the spread of those things, which is something we can kind of understand today, right? Um, and so, uh, and you think about it, if you've got mildew in your house or mold growth in your house, that's unhealthy. Uh, so God gives instructions on how to deal with that. Um, uh, if you want to know specifically, feel free to read chapters 13 and 14. Uh, but we see God's concerned uh, with the health of his people. Uh, chapter 15, well, we'll read just because it's fun to make people blush. And, um, and, I was thinking of having other people read that, but again, the problem with the microphone and getting everybody up here and all that. Uh, so I will read them, uh, but y'all get to feel uncomfortable because we're reading this in church. So Leviticus chapter 15, verses 1 through and 2. So we got some, some natural bodily functions going on, right? These are not sinful. They're not you know, ugly or anything like that there, but God declares these to be unclean. And if these happen, that's fine. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. They're normal. But before you come into the tabernacle, uh, before you go, uh, uh, uh dealing with the, or, or involving yourself in the community, then there's some, some ritual that needs to take place to make you ritually clean again. And, um, uh, we can see some hygiene stuff there, uh, but it's going to go uh, beyond that. So how, how do we explain these laws then? Um, what's in these for us? Uh, first, let's go back to remember, these are all deriving from God's grace, from God's desire to be with his people. Um, and so even though they, they, they seem strange, they come out of God's desire for us. Um, and Israel's obedience to these laws is out of gratitude to God and their continuing desire to live in God's presence. They don't want to live in God's presence. They don't have to do this stuff. And they can go on about their merry way. And God's not going to be in their presence and they're not going to be in his. Uh, but if they want to be in God's presence as he wants them to be, then God puts these, these strange rules into place. So let's, let's stop for a second and get some feedback from the room here. Uh, can you think of anything that, especially in the early church, when Christianity was a brand new thing, can you think of something that they did that might have been strange or weird? Maybe something we still do today. But it was started in the early church. What? Communion. Yeah, that seemed weird. Uh, there, and that, that got us accused of being cannibals, uh, cause we ate the, we drank the blood and ate the body. 
And so for, for a few centuries, uh, Christians were accused of being cannibals. Um, uh, uh, so that seems strange. Baptism, and uh, nobody was really doing that kind of thing. There's some correlations of some stuff that was done in, in Judaism, uh, but really the way we did it, nobody was really doing that. John the Baptist comes along and starts dunking people. And then the Christians take that up and they start dunking people. Um, so that, that seemed strange. Um, the way the Christians kind of withdrew from society in a sense, and they were always together. And they always, as you know, access that the early church had everything in common. Um, that, that seemed strange to people, especially to people uh, when these, these new Christians began leaving the deities that their families had worshipped for generations. And they start worshiping this criminal who was executed on a cross outside of Jerusalem. Uh, that seemed strange uh, to people. Uh, so, um, um, and we can think of uh, some other things like um, uh, James chapter 5 tells uh, those who are ill to call on the elders of the church to come lay hands on them, pray over them, anoint them with oil. Uh, that seems we still get uncomfortable with that stuff today. Let's just be honest about that. Uh, we don't do that a lot uh, uh, unless you're in a more, or if you grew up in a, a more Pentecostal charismatic tradition, they're comfortable with that kind of thing. Um, uh, Methodists are not uh, for the most part, um, uh, but it's in the Bible and we're told to do that. Uh, but one thing we can see uh, uh, from these uh, Old Testament laws and, and some stuff in the New Testament as well is that God cares about the entire individual. Because, uh, see, the laws he gave weren't just, this is how you come and sacrifice to me. Uh, he says, this is how you, this is how you, you know, uh, cleanse yourself after normal bodily function. Uh, this is how you, you handle uh, stopping the spread of disease in the community. This is how you handle, you know, mold in your house. Uh, so God cares about the entire person. Uh, not just the spirit or the body, which, by the way, is not a biblical concept. The division between body and spirits, uh, that comes out of Greek philosophy. Uh, that's, that, that's not in the, 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 the biblical view uh, that the, uh, that's presented to us. Um, if nothing else, these purity laws remind Israel of her identity and relationship with God. Um, think about it. What are the things that make a person unclean? Um, there's, uh, uh, they're pretty much normal parts of life, right? You know, uh, things revolved around reproduction, uh, things revolving around, uh, normal bodily functions. Uh, that makes us unclean. Those are things that make us human. God doesn't do those things, right? God's not a sexual being. God's not a physical being. Uh, so God doesn't get sick. God doesn't have emissions. Uh, and so the, the things that make us richly unclean are the things that make us the most human. Again, God's not saying those are bad. Remember, God created us. He gave us all these functions. Uh, but God is, is drawing a clear, distinct line between the human and the divine. Um, uh, and so uh, God is, is making sure that they understand that they're, that they're not divine, that they are human, and that he is God. Get some feedback here. Do you think this is important for the church today? Why or why not? I think we need to be clear in the church that we are not divine, that God is, and that God's not human, even though Jesus is human as a whole. God, Jesus is God, and yeah, you know, we, yeah, and uh, and so, so we could get lost in that. But what what happens if we forget, like? You see, uh, uh, people teach that, you know, you know, Jesus is just like us. You know, God's just like us. He's cool. He's our buddy. 
uh, he, he, it, where's the problem with that? Yeah, you can forget that you need it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, to share with those online, Liz said, uh, let me pray a phrase it, correct me if I'm wrong. We, we tend to create God in our own image if that line's blurred, right? And, um, and so, um, there's, we, we could have pride issues. We can consider to, to make kind of God irrelevant or we, we, we fail to be reverent before God. Um, um, and so, um, as we, we, we think about the dietary laws, there's some ideas that have been suggested is that they're just arbitrary. Um, uh, some is that they're, uh, another idea, and this is a Jewish interpretation, is that they're, they were ethical, uh, that they would curb human violence. Like God saying, these are the only animals you can eat that kept us from killing everything. Um, uh, there were some uh, theological uh, ideas, maybe, uh, some of these animals may have been associated with pagan worship, uh, aesthetic, uh, ideas that, uh, the unclean animals were the ugly ones and you can eat the pretty ones. Um, uh, that's just an idea that was put out there. Uh, don't buy into that too much. Uh, there's an hygienic, uh, idea that was put out that maybe God made these distinctions for health reasons. You can definitely see that with like shellfish and pork and stuff, especially in days when there's no refrigeration. Uh, but huh? Yeah, but some animals, you know, that that doesn't really hold up. So let's let's skip on uh, um, ahead here. Uh, but if we go back to that idea that these laws remind Israel of their place, then the 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 ritual cleanliness laws remind Israel that God is God and they are not. And these dietary laws remind them that they are set apart and different. They are not like the rest of the world. Um, uh, and we, that kind of holds up when we get back to that vision of, of, of Peter. And we'll skip reading that passage. But Peter sees the vision. The sheet comes down. It's got all these unclean animals. God says, rise up, kill, and eat. And Peter's like, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. And God says it again. And I believe he says it three times, and the, the vision goes away. And immediately after the end of that vision, two guys come from the house of Cornelius, who's a, a Roman centurion. And they call Peter to come to, to Cornelius' home. Peter shares the gospel with them. The Holy Spirit descends on these Gentiles, these non-Jewish people. And, and Peter says, uh, basically to the effect, well, God had, has told me that no person is unclean, that these Gentiles are acceptable to receive the gospel and they're to be part of the church. God never said that. All God did was show Peter a vision of some animals and said, rise up, kill, and eat. Peter interpreted that to mean that these Gentiles are now not unclean, that it is safe for him to be in their house and to, to share the gospel with them. Um, so we, we can see there's some evidence there that these, these food laws reminded Israel that they were different from every other nation and that they were set apart. Um, and as we think about that here uh, for us, for Christians today, do you think we need to be reminded that we're different, that we're not like everybody else in the world, at least that we're not supposed to be like everybody else in the world, right? Um, uh, the Apostle Paul seemed to think that, and we'll close out with this, this scripture. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, starting at verse 14. Paul says, Do not become partners with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with the darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Baal? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of God, as God has said. I will dwell and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch any unclean thing, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. 
So yeah, we're, we're, we're supposed to be different. Um, if we look at the, the, the values of the kingdom that are expressed in the New Testament, they're very different from the values of the world. Uh, very different from the values of all that stuff we're seeing on TV right now. Um, and so uh, it, it's important the, the, it's important for us to study books like Leviticus so that we are reminded that, yeah, we're different too, and that God still expects his people to be different, even if he lets us eat pork and, and shrimp and stuff. Um, and so as we think about that, think about uh, – this week, how are you different? How are you not like every other pagan, you know, forsaken sinner in the world? Um, and um, how does that difference bring glory to God? How does it let people know that there is a God? So let's stop, let's pray, and we'll close out. Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for all that you do for us. We ask you to help us to go forth in this world and to be to be different, different in a way that brings glory to you and different in a way that makes non-believers curious about you uh, so that through the witness of our lives, they may come to have faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, help us to, to live in that place of tension of, of living in a world and, and doing business and, and, and raising kids and all of that, but doing so in a way that that sets us apart as people of the gospel. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Thank you all to, for all who joined us on Zoom. And thank you to everybody who's here in the room. I'm glad to see you again. All right. See you all later.